our wonderful panelists covered uh, different areas and different questions no? uh, regarding uh, uh, the two anthologies. And of course, the two anthologies, the question they uh, both raised is the category of Philippine science fiction and uh, just exactly what constitutes Philippine science fiction. Uh, I think we all express a dissatisfaction with the idea that what can, what will make a story Filipino sci-fi is if you just basically pepper it with local expressions, you, uh, you name your characters, give your characters local, local names, uh, or you set it in a local uh, place. Uh, there should be more than just that. And I'm thinking that some stories succeeded more than the others in regard to that Filipinizing imperative. Um, strangely enough, uh, um, uh, the surrogate succeeds, in my opinion, even if yeah, in many ways I dislike it, uh, because it's religious. Meaning, I think even in the, in, the, in the imagination of our writers, the Filipino future will always have religion, <laughs> which is plausible, right? Because I don't think we're about to get rid of religion anytime soon. And also, the, the stories that succeeded in that Filipinizing uh, uh, project are those that actually are metaphors for the present. Like, I think in science fiction, the future is a metaphor for the present, uh, with which you can understand the present better, right? Um, so uh, yes, those stories where the characters set in, you know, eons into the future and space travel is already a reality, and Filipino, the Philippines is sending, still sending contract workers to other planets, right, to become domestic helpers or, or you know, blue collar workers. That is a bleak sort of projection, but it's grounded in something Filipino because the situation is Filipino. It's not just names. It's not just you know, uh, local color, etc. Uh, I I had questions, I had discussion points, and I didn't read them in the beginning, even if I intended to kill time, because I knew that you would raise them, and you did raise all, almost all of them. I do have some few other remarks that I think might be useful to to discuss or to start to use as a kind of discussion point, and it has to do with language. My first observation is that. Filipino science fiction in Filipino is practically non-existent. If we are calling Philippine science fiction in English, uh, if this is describing it as being in a state of infancy, it's embryonic in Filipino science fiction in Filipino. Hardly anything exists, right? And the reason for that is that English itself is, uh, provides an entry point into the global imagination. And you do understand that the vision of the Filipino humanity in the stories is a global humanity, which, of course, uh, skips over a lot of problems in the press head. And I think it's probably the utopianist, the utopic's uh, sort of bent, is that that problem will not exist anymore. Identity politics will not exist anymore, okay? Now, uh, my question has to do with the fact that the story simplify that. When, if you look at, let's say, Philippine critical writings, meaning the, the critical books being produced by people like Nefertiti Dadyar, Bliss Kualin, Carolyn Howe, and a few others based in UP, they pay attention to, the, to that complexity. That complexity is lost in, in the vision of the sci-fi writers. And I think it says something about probably how uh, there still is need to complicate our vision of the future. Uh, the future is simplistic, somewhat, right? In these stories, the, the vision is either bright or dark, right? There are gray areas, right? And we don't see the grayness much, okay? And I think probably it's, um, um, and the telling thing is that the writers in Filipino are not even doing it. Meaning they probably uh, are thinking that that project is simply not going to be feasible or, or possible. I did remember Luna has left, uh, Luna is still here. You mentioned it in our forum last time. Na mahirap ma-imagine ang, ang Pilipinas na maging robotic. Na pag sinulit mo sa Pilipino lalo na, pero pag nag-English ka, parang pwede-pwede. Kasi uh, that English, that language locates it 
in a translational world. You write in English as a Filipino, and you write translationally. And translation is always speculation, because equivalence between languages is an illusion. That's not real, right? And you just believe it is because it's speculation, it's creative labor. And I think for the writers in Filipino, the mimetic or representational imperative is stronger. It's harder to escape. So again, another bit of observation is, is there some escapism here, right? Which, of course, is true for all literature, but it's truer for certain, certain kinds of literature than in others, despite the fact that there is also strong social commentary. So it's a kind of paradox, no? Actually, that's the point I want to read from my notes. It's a very strong feature. And we're looking for what makes Filipino science fiction insightful or nascent as it is, unique, what could be its distinguishing characteristic. I said maybe religiosity is one, maybe uh, commitment to social issues is one. The other one is political critique. There are chunks of critique yung ating political system na corrupt, nandito, okay? And it's probably um, the critique of neocolonial mentality, that skin whitening story, okay? Um, and then that a story by Eliza no, Rizal, right? Which is strangely prophetic. No? She wrote this a few years ago. And it's all about how in this utopic, actually dystopic future, after an apocalyptic earthquake levels Metro Manila, Quezon City emerges and renames itself as Rizal. Right? And, and it's, very few people live there, but they're all more or less elites. And they want to get rid of everyone else who's sort of like anomalous. And they do it by rubbing them out. Basically, the addicts are rubbed out. And they are branded, the myth is that they are actually eco-terrorists. So that no one will care about them. They're just terrorists, so we, they're dispensable. Okay? Yung ganyan mga stories, um, Maybe the problem is masyado namang minirarendahan yung, yung pedantry, yung kanyang didacticism ng konti. I think it's nice probably to have social commentary and also political criticism, but maybe uh, make it a little more subtle. <laughs> and probably because it's the, the form is the short story, wala sila much time to actually work on the subtlety. Siniksik doon, kaya ang lumabas, oh my God, it's so strong naman, so obtrusive. Now, the literariness is diminished. I equate literariness with understatement, irony, and indirection. I equate uh, direction and uh, uh, propaganda with artlessness. So it's the artful thing has been sort of sacrificed, okay? Uh, now, uh, um, there is a contact point between science and art, and it's metaphor. We both traffic in metaphor as we use explanatory narratives, right? And stories. Um, think of all these wonderful things that have been conjured up by science of late. Right? They're all metaphors. Dark matter, dark energy, string theory, wormholes, right? Big bang. They're substitutions, right? Uh, we in the humanities know metaphors fairly well. It's our business to take care of them, to encourage our students to come up with more and more of them. The rate of turnover is quicker with us for metaphors. In the sciences, as long as a metaphor still has explanatory value, it stays, right? I'm sorry, but Einstein's uh, theory, uh, relativity, it stays, because no one's come up with anything better to explain, right? But uh, science is not dogma. Science is inquiry. And inquiry is characterized by openness, first and foremost. So nothing in science is actually fixed. Right? Then the metaphors will hopefully also change, except at a more glacial rate. Right? Sa amin, uh, in uh, my poetry workshops, ang katutak ang metaphors. Okay? And the good thing about the metaphor, and I don't know, it is like, you know, E, e equals mc squared. That paradox where, whereby energy is equated with matter, that, right? light and, and mass being equated with each other, that's a poem, right? That's a poem. It's probably the best poem from the last, last century. The most, yeah. 
Uh, but we have poems all the time in the humanities. And what's good about our poems, our metaphors, is that while we, we acknowledge unity, we never forget how different those two terms still are. You understand that? So what's good, science breaks down reality into parts and then is so amused and amazed when they come together again. <laughs> They're always together in our minds, but we also see them as different. So it's actually not comparable, I think, right? Uh, to a certain extent. Of course, my, but you see, uh, when this is from Nietzsche, you know, we have words for objects in the world. Like we say leaf. But the leaf is an abstraction for all the leaves, right? Uh, everything, all the language we have is a generalization. I think that's also true for the sciences. So I'm sorry, you said that two things can become one as long as their vectors co coincide. That is, that is a wish, yes. But I think even molecules and atoms and quarks, they are different from each other, except we just call them that to generalize so that we can make certain pronouncements about them. So what do we all have? We only have metaphors, nothing more. We only have substitutions, generalizations, uh, replacements, and things like that. No? And that's, you know, that's a common ground, I think, and we should insist on that. Now, um, let's now uh, uh, maybe ask the audience uh, for uh, maybe three or four questions. We have to four, we have around 25 minutes. So if you, those who've been listening to the presentations, if you have any questions, approach the microphone and introduce yourself and go ahead and ask. Question. Students, so Gabby and my own students, Joseph, you're here, I see you. <laughs> and Ram, you're here, rapid eye movement. <laughs> yes. Hi, good afternoon, my name is Joshua. Maybe right Hello. And my question is to Sir Tapang. Uh, because I heard you said that there were two advanced civilizations as predicted by the new equation previously. And I would like to ask on what scale could you say that they're advanced? Like, do you use the Kardashian scale or any other scales that were newly devised by people like Carl Sagan or perhaps Professor Dyson? Uh, no, um, <laughs> the reality of what they're calling down. <laughs> no, uh, just to not to make it too uh, technical here. Uh, the idea really is that can you detect what can you detect from technologically advanced uh, civilization. So it's either the signals that they make, like the sex bomb dance or song that you meet with in the ship, or uh, whatever they're beaming out in their own TV if they have a TV in them, maybe in, in that civilization. So that's actually the, the quote unquote um, uh, criteria for the advanced technological uh, civilization that we have. Uh, of course, it, these are estimates. Okay? Uh, the, the number two that came out there uh, are estimates based on current um, uh, observations of the, of the galaxy. Uh, as I said, with better telescopes, it might even come up or it might be zero. Uh, but the, the, the problem with waiting for aliens to come is that you'll never know if they're there until they come. Okay, until the, uh, the, the ones in uh, Visitas really visits us. So in, uh, that's the only problem with waiting for aliens. I'd like to give an answer also. Uh, I'm assuming the number was reached at using the, some variation of the Drake equation. Uh, the earlier iteration of the Drake equation put the figure at a much higher number, right? Hundreds, if not thousands. Uh, in our solar system, in our galaxy alone, 
But this new one, which I admit to having heard of only now, uh, puts it at 2. But I think if, if it's uh, just the use of the Drake equation, it wouldn't really say if it's a type 1, type 2, or type 3 civilization. But what's to, what we have to uh, remember about potentially communicating with an alien species is it's one of the fundamental problems to that, and that's what explains the Fermi paradox partly, is that um, we're probably using signals that they've gone beyond already. Like, there's no, like, for example, we still use radio waves to be able to communicate, but they might not, that might not register in their wavelength anymore. Or they might be completely different beings that they exist in a different dimension and they see the world, see the universe in a different way. So we are working with speculations that the best way to reach an alien species is with our own technology, when in fact their technology might be so beyond our own. I still have a question. He's a creative writing student, right? Okay, so. There you go, you do have science-minded uh, writing students. <laughs> and we do have uh, humanities-minded scientists, okay? So we have that happy uh, happy um, communion right there. Any more questions? I have a question about humor. I thought that the sex bomb story that we've been dissing certainly anonymously at least has humor as a kind of um, reward. I mean, it's, it's funny enough, right? It's also metafictional in the sense that it addresses the reader directly and, tra and tries to explain the popular culture allusions for the sake of the reader. So I'm thinking that that kind of story is somewhat not really sci-fi sci-fi, because it's self-aware and it's almost poking fun at itself. Because it's poking fun at the conventions. There's a love story there. He's a mis he's an outcast, a geek. No one likes him. He's weird, and he turns he's the one who saves the whole generation starship, right? Because he's oh, the only one who invent who was geeky enough to invent a neural band that prevented him from becoming hypnotized like everyone else, who got turned into sex bomb zombies. The science teacher there, because is a bad scientist. That's a dichotomy you find in a lot of films, right? In sci-fi films where there's a good scientist and a bad scientist. So he's a bad scientist, and his intention is to crash the ship into a planet because he stopped believing in the mission of the Generation Starship itself, which is to keep basically what? Put, uh, put the, uh, yeah, being sort of a pod where you, the humans can keep reproducing so that they can colonize the universe, right? Something like that. He wants that to end. So he basically, what did he do? He, he hijacked signals no, from Kid Bulaga and, and then basically used the sex bomb numbers to hypnotize everyone, okay, or something or other like that. So it may fun, I'm thinking. Humor is it's a welcome thing in sci-fi, except the moment you insert humor, then you undermine the the doorness of sci-fi. There's something door about sci-fi because it wants to propose a possible future, and you cannot be ironic about that. Because if you're ironic, then the possible future cannot be possible, diba? Give me an example of, the, of an uh, even the other funny story, the incipient end of the world, which reminds you of Mars attacks. Basically, the aliens arrive, and um, there's this global broadcast of the alien leader, right, giving a speech to all of humanity. And just before giving a speech, he eats a chihuahua, and the whole world panics because everyone knows the world will end because they will be, we will all be eaten up by the aliens. And then, of course, uh, the story is very local. There's a, a girl who has always had a crush on this guy, that he, but, but she's been too shy and proud to admit it. Finally, because the world is ending, she admits it. Right? right after doing that, the misunderstanding is revealed. The aliens pala didn't know that the word love means many things. They thought that humanity loved dogs in the same way that they love hot dogs. So the alien leader ate the dog thinking that's a good gesture. And so the poor main character has already opened up her and bosomed her love and she regrets it. She wants the world to end for real or something like that. Another funny story, but only two. 
really, it was two books, only two funny stories. And you cannot, I, cannot, I listed them as my, I mean, not the a sex bomb, actually, I mean, too much. But the excitement end of the world, I thought would be one of my favorites, because it's kind of funny, and it's unique, and then it undermines its own seriousness as sci-fi. And I think maganda rin yung tangin cheek na gano'n na irony na yun, kasi sci-fi can get really, all these dystopias, they're too much na, mga, ano nga yun, divergent, sino sino yung mga dystopia, di ba? Too much! Let's have fun! Mas gusto ko pag, yung pag nagka-spoof version na siya, yun na mas magugusta ko siguro. Right? Like yung, ano, yung ginagawa naman normally yan, yung, bang, yung uh, Twilight nagka-spoof na yan, di ba? Sana i-spoof na nila lang yung mga dystopian sunod-sunod na yan. That would be fun. Okay, the Gabby will, of course, has read more sci-fi than I have. Um, there is actually a genre called humor sci-fi. It's, it's actually a sub-genre. Um, one of the more popular novels, for instance, is Red Shirts by John Scalzi, which imagines um, the presence of, if you're familiar with the concept of the trope of Red Shirts from Star Trek, so they're always dead. Because in Star Trek, okay, in Star Trek, the the expendable military people are usually in red, so that's why they're called red shirts. So you'll never know their names, and then they eventually die, um, either at the beginning or at the end of the episode, and then nobody mourns them, nobody really cares who they are, but so then they just die for the sake of plot. Okay. Um, so the novel Red Shirts actually uses the concept of the expendable character in science, which is a trope in science fiction. Um, it actually shows us their personalities um, and how they are actually taken over by the narrative, which makes them do stupid things in the story when, in fact, ayo din nila namang mamatay. Okay, and so um, the idea of it's because naman po yung fanfic. Pero it's the use of tropes. This is science fiction has its own tropes. Um, and it uses this in various ways. Or for instance, in um, the Hugo Award in Story Cat Pictures, Please, um, where you have a robot, but instead of wanting to take over the world, which was his original programming, he just wants to make everybody be better versions of themselves. And no matter what, an AI. Um, so he wants people to be better versions of themselves. So he, so the AI creates algorithms that suggests to people things they should do, but at the end of the day, it is still the choice of the human being doing or acting, and all the AI can do is suggest, you know what, let's not kill each other and just show each other cat pictures, and that's great, isn't it? Um, and again, this is a very deft and humorous touch. So um, I think one of the problematic stereotypes of science fiction and science in general, it is a very serious affair in capital letters. Um, when in fact, I find that a lot of science fiction that especially is coming out from younger writers actually plays off not just the science in science fiction, but also the absurdity in which human beings use science for their own games, um, or not use science for their own games. So maybe if one of the characteristics, again, of Filipino science fiction thus far, that there is this sort of preference for fake thoughts and drama, no? and melodrama, Pinoy na Pinoy. So, ganon. So, yung dalawa exception na nakakatuwang kwento, na nawalan sila, lahat na melodrama, high drama, space opera types. Okay. Um, now, I have a question. There, uh, there are gadgets and machines with interesting names in many of these stories. It's almost like a requirement, since these are technological kind of sci-fi pieces, no? Their names are various, like Maker Clay, Injectable, Ansible, Neural Band, Alter, and Your Own Orb. I old they Oh, okay. Well, do you have a favorite among these gadgets and why? It's a beauty pageant question. I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to read which I just mentioned a while ago. So we can read it. But on the flip side, uh, here I am again, potentially dissing. Um, there's one story um, which overly does it, I think. Uh, there's a story. Should I say? Okay. Offline sanction, sorry. Um, like every paragraph or every sentence, there's a new term of a new weapon or a new armor. And by the fifth one, I'm like, okay, I get it. This is the future. 
we have a new invention, this is something that we haven't seen enough. Okay? So it can go overboard also. But the Noto Corp thing and the Baker Clay, which are in the same story, are fascinating ideas. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, I'll cheat because I'll talk about my own story. Or, because I don't know, but I'm here. No, Gabby, that that orb is can be real. It's not. It's probably already here. I actually based it off um, Google Glass. Um, I read an essay called by Gary Scheidengard, who is a CNF writer. Um, he wrote a very long review, and essentially, put money, money, nya, because he was given a pair of Google Glasses to review. Um, and instead, it became a very long meditation on what do we mean when we talk about being connected to each other. Because if you're familiar with Google Glass, which has been discontinued, um, it allows you to project, to use your glasses as basically a projection screen. So instead of looking at your smartphone, kind of the next idea was wearable tech. So you could, um, so Google Glass was uh, one of these inventions. Um, and so to me, I just extended the idea of being able to see things and, and projecting it into a more holographic. Um, so yung extension ko. So yung ginamit kong logo sa kwento. Um, and, and I did that intentionally. Um, kasi to me, it was one of the things I wanted to explore. Um, and also one of the things, I, and I'm, right, I'm saying this from a writer's perspective, uh, one of the things I wanted to explore was actually a teenager's, um, how, why is it that for many of my students, hi guys, uh, hi, students. Um, for many of my students, it seems that they, they, they um, found it more important to have digital connections rather than real world connections. Um, and I thought that, sorry, <laughs> you know what that is? Oh, yeah, oh my God, it's really nice. Okay, guys, you know what that means. Um, I wanted to explore the relationship of why teenagers, or uh, my students in particular, prefer digital connections rather than real world face to face connections. And so to me, the orb was the, the mediating factor. Because it can be used in the world. At kaya niyang gawin niya, kaya niyang tanggalin yung mga ayaw niya, at ibalik yung mga gusto niya. So, yun yung kumbaga para sa akin, an extension of a real world, of a real world technology into something that was more effective. Thank you. I just located a question that I, I think I, should, I want to ask you guys. And this has to do with, uh, Let's disabuse ourselves now. Sci-fi is global. It's not just Western. Because we can't kind of say equating it with the, with the West. It's not. There is African science fiction. Very good African science fiction. They call it Afrofuturist fiction, right? So my question is this. The search for Filipino difference is confounded by the belief or faith in, the human, in human universality or sameness, which indeed is echoed in many of these stories. This tension or contradiction doesn't seem to be worked out on the philosophical level by these pieces, which perhaps renders them somewhat lacking in gravitas. Because there's no attempt to actually put, uh, no, problematize that. It's a problem, right? Perhaps what they lack is a commitment to a powerful Filipino story or myth, one that can resonate on many levels for the Filipino reader. In this regard, Afrofuturistic science fiction comes to mind, which effectively works precisely because it continues to mine and transfigure the history of slavery for which it keeps finding new and compelling metaphors or allegories. What might be a good Filipino myth, right, that our sci-fi writers might do well to consider? Ocampo's story, Infinite Degrees of Freedom, is on the right track, he thinks. It harks back and creatively appropriates images from our lower mythology and interweaves them with futuristic scenarios. That's why I liked it. It had that rooted thing to it, which the other stories didn't have. And then the drama, the typical drama between father and son, sort of made it even richer. Right? Also, Gabby will disagree. No, I won't disagree. Um, but I think that one of the things that you mentioned, you know, with Afrofuturism, is actually a gen in science fiction, in science fiction community, there is a definite um, movement towards diversity. So it is moving away from you know, see old white men writing military space conquest stories. 
um, and looking at more diverse voices and authors, of which you know, Afrofuturism is at the forefront, but you also have Silk Punk, for instance, um, in China. Um, and here, yung, yung konting lumalabas sa global sphere, tinatawag nilang Bamboo Punk. I don't, not, I don't agree with, the, with its label, but from the Philippines, yun yung parang na-attached to the title. I mean, I think it has to do kasi din with the movement in... Only Isabella, um, who doesn't even write specifically science. Uh, in the Philippines, no, no she's not. She, because she's she's still out. Yeah, um, there's very few Filipino writers on the global uh, level of science, the science fiction community that that is participatory. Like one of the most popular um, people or personalities that I know um, is Charles Tan and he's not even, he is more of a, a collector and he is more of an interviewer and an archivist. Uh, um, and yet, siya lang, uh, prior to Alyssa, Alyssa Wong being nominated for the Hugo Awards, he was the, actually the first Filipino who was nominated for the Hugo Awards, which is the biggest awards in science fiction. Um, and so feeling ko, Cool. Kasi nga, as, as Sir Neil mentioned, kulang pa tayo ng particular flavor that makes us, and not and even hesitant to use the word flavor, kasi it parang ginawa lang siyang as in na paminta. Na, um, but that particular Filipino-ness that I think um, influences us to explore. And I think one of the things that makes us hesitant to explore is that we are all, we are, and certainly I speak for myself also as a writer, is that I'm not afraid of science fiction. I am the only writer here surrounded by these fantastic scientists, where I learned more about science than my four years of undergraduate GE and my how many years of grade school and high school science. And yet I learned more in this couple of hours just listening to them talk about the things they're interested in. And I think one of the things that makes us hesitant as writers to write science fiction is what if we get it wrong? What if somebody points out, ay, mali yan. Hindi naman kayo scientist, bakit mo sinusulat yan? Hindi mo kayo mathematician, bakit mo sinusulat yan? And that is a very legitimate fear. Because no matter how much research you do, there will always be somebody who will question that particular knowledge bank that you have. And I think that's something that we need to learn how to overcome as well. Actually, the, the answer. <laughs> actually, I will answer it myself. So I'll, I'll answer your first uh, question earlier about um, because I was asking about what makes uh, the Filipino store a science fiction. What will be retained the Filipino with all these new technologies that will be coming up if ever? Um, I think writers should think about that harder because it's, it's so easy to go, to fall back to the present. Ito lang project ko, ito na yan. Global news, nagyarapan, etc. And you know, you're just making, as you said earlier, just a social commentary of the present. But uh, to project it even more in, uh, in a more hard science fiction, I don't know how to do that. That's a problem for the writers to actually explore. On the other hand, um, you know, good science fiction in the past doesn't really have to be right. It just has to give you enough of the imagination that it can be. Uh, and uh, as long as there's the germ of science there, uh, and not even even if you know it's not going to be true. For example. Um, space travel, right? Faster than light space travel. As, as of the moment, it cannot happen. But you know, you you forget that right after reading, you know, we're in a space uh, travel in the, in the next year, that I think is uh, Gaia or wherever. Indeed, it's essential But you know, uh, the fact that you can imagine interstellar travel is already, I think, enough uh, starting point for stories. After all, if it is art and if it is fiction, it begins with the real but ends with the true. The real, the, what limits the real is what can be experienced. What limits the, the, the true is what can be imagined. 
our commitment, I think, even sci-fi writers, is not to the real, it's to the true. And the true is unbounded, right? And so there is that possibility again. If the mathematician has the same commitment, not, I think, to the real, but to the true. And the true is a work in progress. It has yet to be envisioned, and it's always constantly being envisioned, even by the scientists, so the more theoretical ones. Anyway, the practical ones, no, they're, they're trapped in the real. And they're probably engineering too. Okay. Uh, kawawa naman si ano, what's it, what's it, who's that engineer in ano, in um, Big Bang? It's a wahalo, yeah, yeah. So, kasi papapating sa kanya, right? Oh, he's the guy who goes up, well, he looks all over the place, right? But you wanted to say something, John, and I think we should be wrapping up, actually. Okay. Uh, may I, I, I'd like to address the idea, uh, the issue of why is it that sometimes we can find anything, or we cannot define what should, what we can consider, or when we can consider science fiction as authentic? Okay, know. We know. Um, I think that's tied to the issue why there are not so much science fiction that that's written in Filipino as well. Siguro kasi nga, ganyan sa mo, mas natuto ka pa dito ng science, ng more science than when you were in your high school or college, which means that basically maybe that's the problem. For example, why is it that they colonized Madalas, Star Wars and all? Eh, kasi ito yung mga imperialists in the first place, that's their experience, and if they are to extend that experience to space, okay, let's colonize a planet. And it's the same way sa atin, ang nahahighlight kung ano lang yung experience natin. For example, I have an OFW na parent, or maduling payatas at all. So kaya yung jeep yung dudes. Tapos, eh, pero kung minsan parang pilit, di ba? Minsan basta mayroong, basta may gadget, sci-fi na siya. Tapos ipipilitin mo dun sa, okay, there's a Filipino condition. Gagawin mo melodramatic, okay, Filipino na. Tapos kung minsan yung hindi hindi, hindi nagsaswa, na you can trace that to the problem that, kasi in the first place, baka nga wala nga kasi, or ang tawag dito, hindi masyado, or hindi marami, yung may scientific literacy na, sa, dapat sa basic education pa lang meron ka na. For example, kaya natural mag-isip siguro yung mga Japanese na philosophy of man, of uniqueness, kasi baka nga may, baka naman kasi nung grade school pa lang sila, tin, uh, they, they were accustomed to those ideas already. And so it was so natural to, to imagine, what if, what if there, I have a classmate who was actually God, and but she thinks that she's not unique. So things like that. So I think rooted siya, grassroots problems siya talaga. Same way na kung bakit hindi makapagsulat in Filipino. You don't have a word for brown dwarf in Filipino. You definitely don't have a word, or uh, ang tawag or at least not the actual term, but when we discuss these things, we cannot discuss them if not in English, unfortunately. So, Pero may class dimension din kasi siya, no? It is a bit of a luxury for a Filip to require a Filipino student to ponder, I think, what uh, such imponderables when, in fact, the more pressing issue, the question is what is to live, to survive, to find a means to survive, uh, surviving. But I also have another sort of uh, response to that. Um, and this has been my sort of my pet theory for like as long as I can remember it, but for the last 10 years, I think. Um, uh, we have only been recently literate as a whole, as a country. Uh, the Spanish period didn't give us any literacy. It did have some, it did turn some of us literate, the Principalia, right? People like Rizal, the Illustrados, but basically there was no literacy. But it, it, it doesn't mean we didn't have a culture. We were an oral society. And that orality is residual and also powerful up to now. Which, which explains why most of us don't read. How many Filipino students have read novels, complete novels, right? They read what's required of them. They don't read. Now, if the problem is this uh, 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 kind of preliminary kind of literacy, which is not really rooted yet. Now, you think of Japan and these other, they had scriptural traditions early. You know? they, had, they had Shinto texts, they had Buddhist texts, they all had that. You know? We have 
very beautiful oral cultures. So now we're publishing the complete epics of the Panay Bukid you cannot, you cannot sneeze or scoff at these no, at these epics, huh? Right? Thirteen volumes, the complete epics of one island land. If you put the epics together, they make one mega epic, longer than the Mahabharata. The memory of that kind of work, but the communal memory. But it was still oral, which means probably, really now, we need more efforts exerted towards turning our, our people more literate. In the old sense, not hyper-textual literacy, but textual literacy. Because the horrible thing about information technology is it has not, in fact, intensified or magnified memory. It has dissipated it even more. Just because of the dromology, the sheer pace of information and the turnover rate of, of data, your memory, you're distracted eh? I mean, Maricar, Maricar Reyes and these other women who were scandalized in videos, they should count themselves lucky for having been scandalized during the information technology age now. Because if it was they would have probably killed themselves, right? Out of shame. But no, Maricar and Katrina, they're happily married in respectable families with good careers. Why? Because people forgot. Bakit ang kalimutan kasi napalitan na dami dami eh, you're drowning in porn. So why would you recall the particular thing you saw? Eh, dami dami na. So, you understand that? We need more literacy of the traditional bookish sort. Please don't get rid of the humanities, because that's where people become literate. Without that literacy, there's no numeracy, I'm sorry. Okay, meaning I'm exceeding higher form of abstraction and science and math. Medyo mababa kami kasi nasa body kami, sexuality, you know, imagery, imagination, di ba? Senses, yan. But without that, hindi ka makakataas. Wala ka magagawa. Di, di ba? Look, look at these very literate people here. Okay. Uh, Alright, so we're done. Oh. <laughs> It's become ano, ano, a forum to talk about that. So maybe we'll give each of them ano, a couple of minutes to just say goodbye. <laughs> Not to wrap things up. So we begin that from Gary towards John. Uh, and just to count people down, people that have come physics, I used to know zero units. Uh, <laughs> the fact, uh, That's why he's here. You know, uh, the reason why. I'm, I'm trying to imagine the science uh, without literature and uh, you know, not just how they will write their papers, but how they will read texts like this uh, if they cannot even understand the beautiful phrases that you might, it's not always fine, <laughs> but you might find there, uh, they can appreciate it in their own little way, but they cannot express uh, themselves uh, well. Uh, on the other hand, um, science really does uh, try, uh, is, is going to build upon each new discovery and it will be changing the material conditions of the, the world. Okay? Uh, the problem really is until we catch up on our experience of that uh, condition and reflect upon it, uh, it would just be some new other newfangled discovery that will not make sense uh, some ating mga tao. So, sci-fi, for example, really gives us the the the, the, the imaginable. Okay? And um, although I, I, I'm not sure in the Philippine setting kung mauna yung sci-fi, this is a science uh, because, um, well, it's NASA. The other one is we don't really do much science here in the country. So I, I don't know what that, uh, that the future for that will be, but you know, it's interesting that we have this and you should actually, you, I, I don't know if I can, <laughs> uh, encourage doing, uh, exploring more of this uh, in the future because you know, there are a lot of things you can write about, 
NATO ugye a filipítőket is betöltőjük a kívülőket is van. So, uh, we, we actually have kind of the opposite problem in Ateneo. In Ateneo, the science is going down in terms of number of units. The humanities are staying up. Uh, but regardless of that, uh, I think, um, philosophy, is that the core. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, it's all about interdisciplinary. Actually, it's the biggest buzzword in Ateneo now. Interdisciplinarity. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, that's why I'll be proud to tell my Ateneo colleagues that I was here and I did this. Uh, I'm always happy to talk about talk about science fiction, talk about my interests, and share share that with people. Oh yeah, I, I, I do research in biology. I not technically because my work is not that type. It's it's more theoretical. I I I have sort of left left marine bio. Um, I encourage everyone, of course, to keep on reading science fiction. Thank God for writers like Gabriel, uh, who will keep on pushing for and championing Filipino science fiction. For us, science fiction in general, right? Um, we are lucky that we are living in a time when we have at least five science fiction movies every year. Like this last year, we had Arrival. Excellent, excellent, right? This year, we have the new Blade Runner movie, the Annihilation movie. We have the new, right? very exciting. We have the new uh, Alien movie coming out. And then we have a lot of sci-fi anime that are they're out there. So just immerse yourselves in the science fiction and probably when you have time, do a bit of reading of the science just so you can have a better appreciation. Visit uh, uh, <laughs> Sir Slab where you can see robots. You have robots. So immerse yourselves in both the science fiction and the science. Hi guys. Say to Gita um, uh, what I wanted to encourage in both my science fiction, whenever I teach science fiction, um, one of the things I w always want to encourage is experimentation, which is done both in the sciences and actually in the creative arts. One of the things in which we learn what we can do creatively is when we experiment. And usually when we fail at these experiments, that's when we learn how to make it better. And it's not just in the sciences that we test ideas out, we do it in writing as well. And the more you are informed by the things that you're interested in, whether it's science fiction, um, metafiction, fantasy, whatever it is that you're interested in writing, as long as you're better informed in your reading, then you are better informed in your writing as well. And I think that's very important in whichever discipline you're actually in, to be always better informed. Yeah. Okay, to close the uh, I'd like to end uh, by the uh, science and humanities, there should not be a fissure between them. And I'm thinking that sci fi is a very good medium to show that there is a possible harmony between the two. And it is not only a possible harmony, start it that way, start it as it's all philosophy and that branch out lang into science and arts and whatever. Um, ang tawag dito? Yung gaya nga sa Sir Jane uh, imagination is prerequisite to doing science and mathematics. As I said, if you're a pure mathematician, you really have to imagine. And science, let me just say that even the scientific method is itself a dogma. Science is a human endeavor. That's what you have to realize. Science is a human endeavor. Science is bound by politics. Science is bound by be beliefs and dogmas. And science itself submits itself to science. That if the dogma scientific method doesn't work, we have to change that method. If this is not efficient anymore to find out truth or reality or whichever. Now, um, so what I want to say is, so I hope that sci-fi is uh, will continue to be a medium for people to see the connection between the two and also um, 
I hope that sci-fi will also be a good medium for people to have scientific literacy. May joke kami sa math na mas marami pa kami natutunan sa Big Bang, sa panonood ng Big Bang Theory kaysa pag-attend ng class. Which is true. No? Kasi mas maganda yung anak. Hindi, ang point ko dito ay ito. It's not to mock professors, but it's the analogies. The analogy to the human condition like, okay, what's Schrodinger's cat? Uh, it's like you deciding whether you want to take this girl or not. So these very down-to-earth analogies make you grasp that very, what you might think, stars light years away na idea. It's not light years away, it came from the brain. So the whole invention versus discovery question of mathematics is absurd. It's both. It's the beauty of the neural networks in your brain that make you think that. So I think that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me just read something that I wrote for the introduction to the Lika and, uh, uh, Lika and Journal no, last year, where I basically weighed in on this uh, issue. Um, there is a rudimentary oneness in nature that defies both analytical decomposition and disciplinal boundaries. The contact zones between the arts and the sciences are multiple and fascinating and in constant flux. And they bid us to see that both realms of experience are important, trafficking mutually as they do in analogical modes of thinking and perceiving. Thus, they should not be made to compete with one another. We dignify our world and ourselves by recognizing wholeness. We parse and hierarchize knowledge to our own peril. So, not that the sciences are superior to the arts or vice versa, but that we actually are equally important. And let's hope the university will always remember that. Thank you very much. And